like over the years, I sort of developed a bit of a disdain towards made-for-TV movies. Like, honestly, I think that's a pretty popular opinion to hold for some reason. TV shows, that's fine. Maybe they didn't always have the prestige of being filmed, but they were still really popular. But TV movies? Nah. That's where actors who couldn't crack the big time were doomed to languish, or that was my initial point of view. Stuff like High School Musical would come out on Disney Channel, I wouldn't even give it the time of day. Why would I? Thought teenage me. That's trash, garbage, no good, I don't need that in my life. And so I got on with things, until a couple of years ago, when my girlfriend sat me down and force-fed me. Not only the High School Musical trilogy, which I now recognise as the goated franchise, but also The Descendants, which I really thought I was going to hate, but that I actually have a weird little affection for. Like, is it massively well made? No. <laughs> but for some reason, I love this franchise, and particularly the first film. And today we're going to be talking through it because I don't think I'm alone in my love for it. It's an absolute classic, and it did very well. Got good reviews, high viewership, despite its... Uh... Let's say uh, middling production values and some of the wackiest and dankest writing of all time. <laughs> but yeah, let's jump into the movie, starting with the story. So, the film opens with a bit of narration, for some reason, using an iPad. Why do they have an iPad in a fantasy world filled with old-timey characters? I'm not sure. But we do learn a few ridiculous things about the world in which they inhabit. Beast married Belle, yeah, yeah, yeah. And somehow, he managed to combine all the different fairy tale kingdoms together into one. Yes, he must have used magic to form them into one landmass too, right? Because isn't he French? I mean, don't let the American accents fool you. And they also have all those other random fantasy European kingdoms. China's there. Neverland is over there. Like, what the hell's going on? This has got to be some of the wackiest world building of all. Like, what's going on? Also, United States of Auradon. Oh. Also, they've elected a king. Who voted? Did all the other kings get a bigger vote? Did the people get the vote? Well, why not have it be a proper democracy where you're only in office for so long? Bit selfish. But then again, not a shock as he was turned into a beast initially for being selfish. And in real life, the French royal family was so selfish their own people killed them. But sure, go off, fairy tale characters. Elect this guy. Also, check this out. Cinderella'sburg. <laughs> I guess the writing team was not working too hard on this one. Like, why is it called Cinderella's Burg? Is it Cinderella's kingdom? But wasn't she just some random, a civilian? Wouldn't the kingdom have a proper name already? She married into the family. Ugh, anyway. Beast is apparently a piece of work, and he gathered up all the villains, the sidekicks and whatnot, and dumped them into an underdeveloped slum called the Isle of the Lost, with no magic and seemingly very little technology or good living conditions. But yeah, they just ditched them there, and they let the kids grow up in crushing poverty. Well, <laughs> not very heroic of the heroes. Also, apparently the son of Bal and Beast gets to be crowned king at 16. So, guess that whole election thing? That was a one-time deal? I love democracy. I love the republic. Because now a teenager is going to be making all the decisions unilaterally. Hmm. Sounds like a recipe for revolution and complete disaster. The dude is still in high school. How is he going to have time to run the country when he has a biology essay due on Wednesday? <sighs> and this dude, well, at least he made some good decisions already. He made a proclamation to grant some mercy to the innocent kids, starting with four of the children of some of the most heinous villains. And these are conveniently the four lead characters who have been chosen, who all conveniently are best friends with one another. What do you know? And it's here that we get the first song of the movie. And whoo hoo hoo boy, it's a good one. Rotten to the core, truly the dankest of songs. Pretty much these kids talking a big game about how intimidating they are. The dance is goofy, but it's fun. The song is honestly a bit of a bop. And my god, the dubstep section. <laughs> oh man, that is nostalgic. Different times, I tell you what. Although I do think that, and honestly, this is a problem with all the songs in the movie. They do not look like they're singing this song. Like, you know, the songs are so overproduced that it does not look natural anymore coming out of their mouths. It doesn't match up. But I think this almost adds a little bit of goofy charm to proceedings. And then somehow, despite the broken bridge and apparently no way to contact Oradon at all, word gets to them that these four have been chosen. And so despite their protests, they're packed off to the mainland to go to boarding school. A couple of things. Why is the evil queen called the evil queen? Does she not have an actual name? Did her parents never even give her a chance at being a good person? And why would she call her daughter Evie? Is her daughter named Evil Queen Junior? Weird. And is Mal Maleficent Junior? 
And also, does nobody else get a little bit uncomfortable that they have Jafar seemingly running the local convenience store? Like, really? Big sus from the writers there. Also, he's the only character to get special ethnic theme music when he's robbing the house. <sighs> Jesus. 2015 was a different time. Also, I never really noticed how funny the Evil Queen character is. Like, excellent sass. Too bad she pretty much never appears in the film after this. But she was fun in this early section. Oh, and I guess that they just drove this car over to the island and then just waited outside whilst the villains obviously plotted. Seems unwise, but okay. And also, on this watch through, it's really sinking in. They've slapped so much modern shit into this franchise. Like, cars? Cars? Come on. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I mean, I know they didn't have the wrappers, but come on, we all know what that is. And how did they develop all this modern technology in like 20 years? I need the deep lore of this world. And then they arrive at Auradon, and it's as awkward as you'd expect a bunch of socially isolated, maladjusted delinquents, meaning privileged prep school kids would be. Lots of delicious cringe to be had in this scene. Carlos and Jay fighting over a, a sweater. I don't know. There's chocolate on their face too. Jay's also trying to crack onto Sleeping Beauty's daughter. And I had to briefly tap out during this scene, not gonna lie. So much premium cringe on offer. Up next, we had Evie crashing and burning, trying to crack onto Ben. Audrey calling him Benny Boo in front of everybody. Yuck, public pet names. And the worst part is, it felt real. I knew people like this in high school that would do this. Ugh. And also the fact that they were greeted by a full marching band. Come on. Anyway, side note, it's also a bit of a lucky coincidence that every single main character decided to have children at the exact same time. Even, you know, ancient witches like Maleficent. And all the villains locked together on the island of the lost. Also, I know it's not really relevant at this point in time, but I did get spurred on by the fact that this whole scene, Evie's making goo goo eyes at Ben. And then I remembered, well, they're not the love interests for each other. And then I remembered who her love interest is. And so after laughing, I thought to myself, wow, you can really tell that despite the modern American setting and the technology and the costumes, that this is still a fairy tale story as Evie ends up with the dweeb in the marching band costume with the specs. Like, sure, Jan. After some pretty funny passive aggression between Audrey and Mal, they head inside. Mal and Ben are vibing. I mean, bad form from this guy, right? Like, your girlfriend's right there, bro. What are you doing? And so this is where we meet <sighs> Doug. Every time I see this dude, I feel like pulling a Homer Simpson. No! How did they find somebody like this? And I mean, oh, geez, I, don't, I don't mean to be mean or anything like that, but maybe I am. Like legit, if anything, they style him so badly here, and yet they style him even worse in the future movies, I'm pretty sure. I think he has long hair and a ponytail at some point. Oh my God. <laughs> and on top of that, how does this dude exist? He seems to be a full human, yet his dad is a dwarf. And not like somebody with dwarfism, he's not a little person. He's a magical dwarf. What's going on here? Also, what person wants to have sex with the dwarf named Dopey? Feels immoral. Can he consent? This guy? This dude? I don't think so. The villain kids then all get together in the boys' dorm later on, where Carlos and Jay are playing the ugliest video game I've ever seen. 1995 called It Wants Its Graphics Back. And yeah, our team go off on a quest to get their hands on the fairy godmother's wand because apparently this kingdom doesn't use magic much anymore. Lame. Why not? Seems like a very useful skill you do not want dying out. But hey, I'm not in charge. And while searching for the wand in a museum, they stumble across statues of their parents, which prompts a song from Mal. Honestly, not the right place for a song in terms of pacing. You want to get further into the story at this point. Nothing has happened yet. And so this one does bog this film down. I mean, for God's sake, it almost goes for two full hours. Although, you know, the song itself is very good, especially once Maleficent joins in. So uh, it sort of balances itself out. It does bloat out the movie. I mean, how did they manage to stretch this movie for two hours? <sighs> But it is enjoyable. <laughs> Look at these fire effects. Come on. What do you reckon the budget was for this thing? Did they blow it all on the sets and the costumes? Or was it just a very, very low budget? <laughs> oh my god. Look at these lightning effects. No. Anyway, they try to get the wand. They can't get the wand. And so now they have to wait and bide their time and attend school in the meantime. And so we get scenes of them at school. 
taking the most insulting class I've ever seen. Remedial goodness. A class that feels like it was built for four-year-olds. You know, Jay then proves himself to be an absolute Chad when he instantly becomes a sports star. And speaking of Chads, there is a character called Chad. Oh. Anyway, there's more open flirting between Ben and Mal. And once again, come on, dude. Once again, you have a girlfriend, son. We then see Evie get manipulated into being an unwitting servant to Chad Charming, who uses his charm to get her to do his homework, whilst Jane also gets manipulated by Mal. Carlos then befriends a dog. He gets over his fear of dogs, and it's never really referenced again until he talks to his mum on Skype. And so the story starts to build. We see our heroes, our villains. I guess they're villains. But they're still the protagonists. You know, they start to settle in. And hey, they even seemingly start to make some friends. A particular highlight for me is when they meet Lonnie, the daughter of Mulan. What the hell is with these names? Anyway, they meet her, she pays 50 bucks for Mal to change her hair, and then her and Jane rip their dresses to try to look like the villains, to try to be cool. (laughs) Oh, this movie's so goofy. It's so stupid. It's so ridiculous. The script is terrible. But why the hell is it so damn good? Like, can anybody answer me this? Why is it so fun to watch this thing? It's not even so bad it's good. It's just legitimately fun. Even though objectively it's cheaply made. But it's just glorious. It interweaves pretty much every single high school after school special trope ever into this film. E.g. in one of the scenes in this compilation of them settling into school, we have the tourney coach get through to Jay the delinquent with a metaphor for sports. Like that's a classic trope. The troubled kid bonds with the coach and uses sports to rise above his situation. Absolute classic. God. Do they still make those types of sports films? I need one badly. The 90s and 2000s, full of them. Absolutely full of them. Bring them back. TV is dying. Sports are the biggest draw. Bring me sports movies. I need them. But yeah, moving on again, we get even more of Ben thirsting after Mal. Once again, come on, bro. I'll say it forever. Stop it. And then she spikes his ass with a love potion. But honestly, he doesn't need one. She already had this dude in the palm of her hand. And within a couple of days, he would have crumbled. Hell, it gets washed off later on, and he doesn't even give a shit. (laughs) What a loyal boyfriend. And so Mal decides that she needs to be his new girlfriend, as that's going to get her better access to the fairy godmother, let her steal the wand, so off to the kitchen. They're making love potion cookies, they need a tear of sadness. And they only get one once Lonnie returns and acts like a massive asshole. Like, she's a nice person, but who the hell keeps prodding about how the villains mustn't love their kids because they didn't make them choc chip cookies? Oh hey there, disadvantaged youths who are raised by evil people in an open air prison. Remember how your lives suck? That's pretty much the vibe of this whole scene. (laughs) Anyway, this whole thing makes Lonnie cry. They get the tear, off they go, they have the cookie. Ben gets manipulated into eating the cookie. Jay's become a chat at school, sports star, popular. All the girls like him, and so suddenly, now he doesn't seem to want to leave. And why would you? His life has done a 180. But anyway, here we get to the best part of the movie by far, where Ben is spiked, becomes a weirdo, who's just obsessed with Mal. Like, legit, this whole sequence, all crowding around him. How you feeling? bro. And then this scene where he just yells out, Mal! I quote that to this day. This is cinema. And speaking of which, then we get the sports game. And honestly, I think I'd watch a full movie about this tourney team coming together to win some sort of big cup. Like, hell yeah! This scene is just fun. Also, is there more than one school in this place? Because who the hell is the other team? And why is the commentator commentating live over the action. Commentators are for TV at home. Surely this dude screaming into the mic would be distracting for the players. Anyway, despite Carlos not actually practicing at all on screen, after all, he was chilling with the dog, he helped score the winning goal alongside Jay and Ben. So sure, why not? Anyway, Ben declares his love for Mal publicly over the mic. And I mean, everybody in the school knows that he's dating Audrey, right? So she's publicly dumped and everybody cheers and claps for Mal. Oh, imagine that. Jesus! That is rough. Then Ben calls for a beat. Doug shouts out in Spanish for some reason. <laughs> Doug, you're so cringe. What? Why? It's oh, He feels like such a weird poser. And then a beat comes in, but one that is clearly not being played by the band. I mean, for one, it doesn't sound like anything a marching band could ever play, but two... Nobody's even touching their instruments properly. You can see it. How the guitar and the bass are not even plugged into amps. Kind of shorty operation this school running. 
Anyway, this next song, banger. And the actual, like, dance and shit, very funny. Highlight for me. Loved when Ben just starts riding around on one of those conjoined horse costumes. <laughs> anyway, in the aftermath of all this, Audrey and Chad apparently instantly start dating. Chad tries to screw Evie over in class for no real reason, especially since she was doing all his homework for him. I suppose that's how you know he's an idiot, because he loses the free ride just to be a bully. Wild. And so this is where the romance between her and Doug kicks off. He argues in her favour, convinces the teacher to let her stay, she passes the test, and so now sparks are flying. Look, I'm not feeling it, but whatever. I guess it's just not my cup of tea. I think most of it comes from the fact that Doug, to me, has negative charisma. No presence at all. Also, it bothers me that he's wearing his hat inside in the classroom, but then when he's outside, he's taken it off. Like, come on. Also, I get it's part of his character, but I cannot get over his fashion choices. Bro. Sheldon Cooper has more style than this dude. Speaking of fashion, Evie helps Mal get ready for a date with Ben. And I gotta say, this whole sequence, very wholesome. They chat about their parents, they bond, it's just nice. I do enjoy uplifting sisterly friendships. We need more of that, hell yeah. And then from here, we suddenly leave the teen fantasy world and drop into an early 2000s rom-com. Hell, not even a rom-com, just, you know, those teen, young adult movies. And man, it's made me nostalgic in a sad way. Like the music, the shot selection, the things they say. Ah, oh, it's a bygone era. Anyway, we get to their date scene, and I gotta say, liked the chemistry, felt very natural. Dude is unexpectedly shredded. Figured he'd be one of those extremely twiggy men. The roar he makes when he jumps into the water. Very cringe. But okay. Then we get a romance song from her. And this song, yet another banger. Holy shit. Although, the whole part where she jumps into the water to save him and starts flailing in water she could wade in. That was a bit forced. A bit weird. But it is what it is, I suppose. Also, why am I so invested in this romance? Like, objectively, she tried to drug and manipulate this guy. So why don't I care about that? Why is this so cute? Then we have to endure some tasty cringe because there's a Skype scene with the parents that lingers way too long and has nothing new or interesting to add, just bloats the runtime. We then get a scene where it's clear that the group is having major doubts about their future, now they're out from under the thumb of their parents and are able to live normal lives. And it's setting up that very obvious swerve, but like not in a bad way. We all knew where this was going from the first 20 seconds of the movie. And oh look, another song! Not a bad one either, but just perhaps a touch forgettable. And then we're back to deep cringe with the Be Our Guest song. Woo-hoo! Everything about this is bad. I am embarrassed for the actors that had to take part in this sequence. Now let's never speak of this wretched acapella dance monstrosity ever again. <laughs> we then have a big garden party scene. And I had more to say about this, but it was at this point that we see Carlos and Jay having fun with the chocolate fountain, laughing and all. And then I remembered, the guy playing Carlos is dead. And he died like five years ago now. Man, what the hell? He's so young here. And four years later, he was dead. <sighs> Shit sucks. And yeah, I was just too sad to focus on much else in this scene. And then, then the parents meet Mal, and it's pretty awkward. And then Audrey's grandma rages at Mal for being the daughter of Maleficent. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. Trauma. But piss off, Nana. <laughs> I reckon you've lost the right to the moral high ground when you're a founding member of the country that established a gulag prison system. Just saying. Then Chad goes off on the villain kids. It all ends up in drama. And he gets publicly drugged and knocked out. <laughs> Good. And then Beast is acting all high and mighty, as if it's Ben's fault for wanting to be a good person who looks out for kids raised on a prison island. Lol. I'm getting heated now. Holy shit. Talk about being on the wrong side of history, mate. And then Doug is such a wimp, such a pathetic little loser, that he sides with Chad. Nah, screw this dude. How does he get the girl at the end? Find somebody new, please. Anyone else. Not this guy. He ain't it. And yeah, what the hell? Jane? Jane? Siding with them too? Bitch, she made your hair all nice. Oh, at least she got punished for being a bully. Eat shit, Jane. And then we've got more romance. That's what I'm talking about. And the reveal that the spell washed off when he was swimming. Oh, why am I swooning? The script isn't even that good. Why am I feeling it? Why is this movie so magic? Woo! Doesn't make any sense to me. Also, I gotta say, bit whack that he got drugged. He had a girlfriend previously. He dumped her under the effects of said drug and he just doesn't care. <laughs> oh, well, screw it. I need a spin-off movie. Just these two. Do it, do it, do it, Disney, you cowards. Give me what I want. 
Anyways, they get to the coronation, and they actually do a really good swerve here at the end, where it builds the drama, it makes you think that Mal's gonna betray Ben, only for Jane to snatch the wand and accidentally release the villains in an attempt to fix her hair. I do have to ask though, has she heard of a salon? Like, come on, kid. Mal then gets the wand, briefly considers being a proper villain, Ben gives a big romantic speech, they're all good, Maleficent arrives, she freezes everybody. I found it quite funny that they seemingly did not use a green screen effect for the frozen people. They just had the actors stand there, I think, because I could see them swaying. <laughs> oh, Jesus! <sighs> it's amateur hour here tonight. And then the villains, or rather, now the heroes, they team up to beat down Maleficent. They turn her into a newt. See you later. All happy endings. Dance number. You know how it goes. And yeah, this movie has no right to go as hard as it does, but it does. It's an absolute banger. Literally the cheapest looking thing they could have possibly put out there. Costumes, effects, the script is so deeply dank, but they managed to pull it off in a way that nobody can really explain or understand. It's straight fire, hell yeah, and the songs are epic, woo! And so with all that being said, these have just been my opinions. Now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of Descendants 1? Did you like it? Hate it? Somehow? Don't be cringe. But regardless, I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know.